Good morning, everybody. Um, today, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit about the institute, this new UNESCO institute I work at in New Delhi, India. And also, uh, today's talk is not so much institutional or organizational. I work for UNESCO, which promotes, which is a pr global promoter of global citizenship education, education for sustainable development, human rights education, and peace education, and so on. But I want to uh, give a more informal talk, uh, unpacking, unboxing this notion of um, global citizenship, peace, and sustainable development. Um, so first, uh, uh, as you can see, because my name is Yoko, which is probably the most popular, uh, well-known Japanese name in the world, uh, but I, I grew up in Tokyo, and I attended a Catholic school from kindergarten to high school. And I don't know how much you know about Japan, but in Japan, the population of Christian population is very, very tiny. It's less than 1% combining the Catholic and Protestant. So in Japan, basically, Christians were like a tiny minority of modernizing elite. And I'm not Christian, but uh, I went to a very sort of exclusive school in Tokyo, and most of my classmates were Catholic. So they are like grandchildren or great-grandchildren of uh, those um, like civilizing elites in Japan from the 19th century. And um, so I kind of, um, I grew up thinking that uh, sort of taking it for granted that, you know, uh, I belong to this very kind of elite, exclusive class. Uh, and that's why I can speak English, because I had English education from, from um, like elementary school, from the first grade. And I have lots of friends who spend lots of time <laughs> abroad. And I never questioned this kind of environment. And then I went to a graduate school in the US and I studied comparative education and I got a PhD. And then I joined the United Nations agency called United Nations University in Tokyo. And then that's how I came to be involved in the United Nations decade of education for sustainable development. And then after a few years, I was asked by the Japanese government to go to Paris, to UNESCO Paris, to work at the Global Secretariat of the United Nations Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, partly because Japan is a funder, is a donor, major donor of this decade. And then uh, two years ago, I moved to India to join <laughs> this uh, institute called Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. And because of my background, I lived in many different countries and I worked uh, in uh, New York, Paris, uh, Tokyo, and now in New Delhi. So people think like I'm a global citizen and I'm often called that, you know, you are like a model global citizen. But I just want to question that is, am I really a global citizen? And uh, this institute uh, is called, um, we call it MGIEP, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. Um, and this is the first uh, UNESCO, um, category one institute of UNESCO in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so which means um, MGIP is an integral part of UNESCO and it's a research institute focusing on education for peace and sustainable development. And I want to start uh, my presentation with two uh, famous quotes attributed to Gandhi. Uh, the first one, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, needs but not every man's 
greed. So this, uh, it, I, for me, to me, this captures the essence of education for sustainable development and global citizenship very well, because it's about values. Um, and also be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, this is often attributed to uh, Gandhi. Um, and this also uh, is very much aligned with the discourse of global citizenship education, which is about uh, uh, fostering um, agency in learners and uh, to uh, create change agents. Um, and then this is uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 4.7. Uh, some people refer to this already, and it's a very long, very long target. So um, I'm not sure if you have had a, like a very close look at this uh, wording before, but it basically says that uh, by 2030, uh, ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. And through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and non-violence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of culture's contribution to sustainable development. And this is very worthy and nobody, uh, opposes all these good concepts included here, but uh, I just want to unpack this and what this means. So uh, I want to ask first a very fundamental question. Why do we educate our young people and why do we learn? Um, anybody? Why do, we, why do we need education and why education is considered as so central to the achievement of all sustainable development goals? Not just SDG 4, but uh, why education is so central? Why are we all here today? Yes, yeah, yes. Fulfilling our potentials. And what kind of discourse is popular among policymakers? Why education is so important? Economic yes, economic reasons. So, yeah, education is for employment, employability as parents or as teachers or students. Education is important because uh, we need education to get a job. But it's not just for, not simply for economic reasons. Um, citizen, yes. So education is to about give voice. It's, it is about al allowing people to participate meaningfully in society, not just as workers, but as citizens. And also education is about our root. It's about understanding where we came from, how we got here. It's about our heritage, traditions, um, cultures, histories. And also it's essentially about our future. It's about what kind of society we want to live in. And where do we find ourselves now? If we look at the job market, do we have uh, sufficient uh, decent jobs? Are we looking at the kind of like jobless uh, economic growth everywhere? And are we maybe looking at like a voiceless kind of development? We are looking at, uh, we are witnessing undemocratic trends, uh, very alarming liberal trends in many parts of the world. And we are also looking at ruthless uh, development. We are, there is a homogenization of culture and transnational migration. It's, I'm not saying it's all too bad, but uh, um, this respect, uh, appreciation of our culture's contribution to sustainable development, uh, this tends to be forgotten. And 
the kind of development we have, we are trashing, trashing the planet. Uh, it's futureless growth. It's not sustainable. And all this, we have ruthless kind of economic development. And this jobless, voiceless, ruthless, futureless, and ruthless uh, development um, we are feeling today. But this conceptualization was done more than 20 years ago by Human Development Report. In 1996, Human Development Report, uh, the United Nations Development Program warned against that if economic growth is not managed properly, it will lead to jobless, voiceless, ruthless, futureless, and ruthless growth. And where we find ourselves today. And if you uh, saw 20 years uh, from um, this conceptualization was done, uh, people are there is a global consensus that uh, this is not inclusive, this is not equitable, and this is not sustainable. So we need, yeah, we need, so all world leaders, 193 countries, adapted uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. You know, we have to transform our world. This is a 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is uh, a call for development that leaves no one behind, and the kind of development um, that uh, for to ensure a life of dignity for all. And then, um, to achieve this kind of uh, world, we need education. We need transform a different kind of education. We need transformative education. So that's why UNESCO calls global citizenship education holistic and transformative education. <clears throat> so now I want to look at, uh, to understand what we mean by transformative education. Um, here, x-axis, uh, um, this is, uh, suppose this is an educational process, and a learning process, educational process can be uh, it can be a continuum between something very prescriptive and something very transmissive to participative, participatory process. And on the y-axis, if this is global challenges or uh, planetary imperatives like climate change, poverty, gender equality, health, all these uh, issues that are captured in sustainable development goals, we can address these challenges in a very superficial way. We can propose superficial solutions, quick fixes, some minor adjustments, or we can propose profound solutions addressing root causes. So when we talk about uh, education for sustainable development, or peace education, human rights education, or global citizenship education, we are always kind of looking at these four quadrants. And ideally, learning process, educational process should be participatory. It gives agency to teachers and learners, and it should address root causes. It's not just superficial uh, solution. We are not just uh, addressing um, quick fixes. So. So to me, uh, so quadrant one is this is transformative education, which is participatory and uh, addresses root causes. So then I come back to this uh, 4.7. Then all these uh, uh, things listed here, good things listed here, have, I think it comes to you more, uh, has like a, more, like a deeper meanings. These are not just words, but sustainable development, sustainable lifestyles, uh, human rights, gender equality. These are about uh, um, all equitable, inclusive, and sustainable development, and promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and cultural diversity, cultural contribution to sustainable development. So if you have this framework of um, 
um, jobless uh, jobless uh, growth, uh, ruthless growth, uh, ruthless growth, um, and voiceless growth. Um, then you can kind of come up with these all these keywords uh, without memorizing, because there's no point in memorizing these keywords. <coughs> So now I move on to uh, the study uh, our institute conducted uh, for the past two years. Uh, this is a report called Rethinking Schooling for the 21st Century. Um, and we looked at uh, policy and curriculum documents, about 200 uh, documents from 22 countries in Asia. and. Uh, we try to capture the fundamental challenges education systems in these countries are facing uh, in terms of uh, meaningful implementation of SDG 4.7. Um, so um, the, we wanted to uh, capture how difficult, we wanted to show how difficult it is to fully capture the intent of 4.7. Um, first of all, uh, concepts embedded in 4.7, all these uh, key words we looked at, gender equality, human rights, uh, cultural diversity, and so on. Um, these concepts have contested definitions, and many are waiting to get comfortably expressed in major languages, in, especially in Asia. Our study uh, covered 22 countries, and we looked at documents in 18 different languages. And secondly, uh, aspirations, this transformative aspirations of SDG 4.7, they could uh, easily contradict with national curriculum objectives and national aspirations. So, um, usually when we do this kind of study, uh, we look at two challenges. One challenge is to mainstream good practices of ESD or global citizenship education into uh, existing education systems. But the more difficult challenge is to, is to transform mainstream education policy and practice to make it an enabler for sustainable development rather than a hindrance to its realization. So what <laughs> I mean by the second one is you can mainstream good practice of global citizenship education without really impacting the mainstream education policy and practice. So uh, to mainstream <laughs> good practices, uh, sometimes can be like uh, walking north on a southbound train. So we are walking, we think, okay, we are making progress, making <laughs> progress, but the train is actually going in the opposite direction. So you're not really, uh, <coughs> this was um, said by a very famous environmentalist from the US called David Orr. He was not talking about global citizenship education. He was talking mainly about environmental education, that uh, we think we are making progress. Uh, if you look at UNESCO reports, UN reports, you know, there are um, many more networks, many more projects on environmental education, human rights education. You know, more these things are more institutionalized. There are more platforms. There are more uh, journals dedicated to these causes and there are NG, more NGOs, uh, civil society is active, but basically the overall trajectory, <laughs> development trajectory hasn't changed. So it's like uh, walking north on a southbound train. Okay. <laughs> yes, so uh, based on the um, this, uh, policy and curriculum review of 22 countries, we identified three major challenges, fundamental challenges to the meaningful impl implementation of 4.7. The first one is uh, challenges about instrumentalism and ethics. The second one is challenges of nationalism and I identities. And the third one is challenges of regimentation and competitiveness. 
um, I'll give uh, some il illustrative example of uh, how these challenges are manifested in textbooks. Um, this is an excerpt uh, from a Pakistani textbook. Um, of social studies textbook. Uh, sorry, the and okay, I read, I quote. So in social studies textbook, it says, uh, here's the results of peace. So textbook lists uh, five results of peace. The first, in a peace-loving society, people live a prosperous life. Second, a peace-loving nation is respected in the world. The third, foreign investors like to invest in a peaceful society that increases job opportunities. Uh, fourth, justice and democracy prevail in a peaceful society. And the five, a peaceful society achieves educational, social, and economic development. So you can see that, uh, so this is for grade four, so nine to 10 year old kids. Uh, this is a prescribed textbook. So these kids are most likely to memorize these as results of peace. And you can see that, uh, for example, a peace-loving nation is respected in the world. This has, you know, um, this is also related to challenges of uh, national pride and identities. And the third one, foreign investors like to invest in a peaceful society. So, you know, the peace, is not the ultimate ob objective, but it is conceived as something that contributes to economic development. <laughs> so this kind of instrumental view of uh, peace, and uh, so, and justice and democracy, without being in explained, it is expected that uh, a nine or ten year old kids can understand justice and peace. So um, this shows the challenge of, yes, yeah, this is talking about peace, but just to talk about like s superficial insertion of peace or um, doesn't make much sense in terms of uh, promoting peace education, for example. And here's some, this is a good example from Bhutan. Uh, uh, Bhutan is a small country which promotes the concept of gross national happiness. So not uh, GDP growth, but um, they want to integrate the notion of gross national happiness in all subjects, in all disciplines. So this is from uh, reading in literature, English class eight. Um, so this is an excerpt from the textbook and it's basically asking we have to acquire a deeper understanding of the total cost of modern life in the context of a finite planet. And children need to learn their lessons from first-hand experience at slaughterhouses, farms, factories, water sources, hydroelectric and nuclear power plants, storage treatment facilities, garbage dumps, uh, pulp mills, logging and reforestation areas, mining sites, etc. So this is really um, inviting uh, learners, students to uh, critically reflect upon the, uh, the total cost of modern life. Um, and because this is a country promoting the notion of gross national happiness, this is closely linked to their national identities. Um, the same with the Pakistani example, it's about national pride. Be, you know, we want, they want to show that they are a peaceful society. But here, uh, it's inviting uh, students to critically reflect on the, on the modernization process. And this is even, uh, it's also uh, reading in literature, English class eight. Um, this is um, asking students to think if it's good, it's a good idea for Bhutan to become a member of WTO. So um, you can see that a very different kind of treatment of global issues in textbooks. Okay, so uh, so this book uh, is uh, many more examples of uh, policy curriculum and textbooks from 22 countries. I only touched up on Pakistan and Bhutan today, uh, but um, I only have five copies, unfortunately, but uh, you can download this from uh, UNESCO's main website. Um, 
And uh, we also have a publication called Textbooks for Sustainable Development. And this is a guide to embedding education for peace, sustainable development, and global citizenship into core subjects, uh, science, math, geography, and languages. And these are like twin projects because we looked at not just uh, our project, this project was not about looking at uh, global citizenship education practices in schools, but to uh, see how uh, these notions are uh, embedded in core subjects. So we looked at the subject curricula of uh, math, science, social studies, and languages in these 22 countries. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And if you like a hard copy, um, <laughs> you can... Uh, you can send an email to me, and I can send out hard copies if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoko Moshituki. Grazie, uh, Yoko Moshituki, per avere colto l'invito a porre domande. Certo, porci la domanda why educate è fondamentale e anche non accontentarci delle risposte più immediate e superficiali e ipotizzare che esistano vie, ad esempio quella dell'educazione trasformativa, che non solo attivano eh, i soggetti in modo partecipativo, superando i limiti di quelli che giusto 50 anni fa di quella che 50 anni fa Paolo Freire chiamava l'educazione depositaria o bancaria, dove il sapere viene accumulato e trasmesso da chi sa, chi non sa, ma un'educazione appunto critica, problematizzante, che affronta alle radici le questioni e le sue soluzioni, non accontentandosi di quelle superficiali.